Hello, I'm delighted to be joined today by Ken Womack, the author of Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans, a book us Beatles fans have been waiting for for a very long time. Hello, Ken, how are you doing? Great to be with you, Colin. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. Thanks very much for doing this. Um, with a story as, as rich as, as Mal, it's, it's very difficult to know where to, to jump in, really. So let's start first by how you acquired the diaries and the manuscripts and the photos and all the lyrics that uh, Mal left behind, because I understand that there was quite a circuitous route and that basically uh, they went through Yoko Ono at one stage. Yeah, um, one of the most interesting parts of this story for me is the mystery of the um, custody of all of these materials, which, um, yeah, if it were, we're in different hem hemispheres for a while. Um, so uh, my 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 beginning with this story really began oh uh, three three years ago during COVID. Um, Gary Evans got in touch with me and you know basically said, "Would you tell my father's story?" And I said, uh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, I would have done so just because Gary's so wonderful. He's a lot like his dad, very affable, uh, engaging, a warm fellow. And um, and we would meet over Zoom, of course, because we were all in lockdown at the time. And I did say, you know, do you have all this stuff that I've been hearing about my whole life? And um, sure enough, he did. He, he sent it here to New Jersey. And uh, I was just blown away. Uh, by the quantity of material, diaries uh, from 1963 to 1974, um, notebooks that Mal kept, about 2,500 photos, um, three manuscripts, uh, two, two in states of completion, um, and lots of just wonderful ephemera like receipts, etc. So, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty blown away by it. And that changed the project considerably because excuse me, it allowed me to bring Mal's voice uh, into the story because what we haven't been hearing from all these decades is Mal. Um, and so now, you know, we have him as the voice of his trials and tribulations uh, in this, this biography. As far as the materials, um, it's really quite fascinating. They were lost. The loss is probably the wrong word. They were consigned to a basement around 1976, 77, Sorry about that. Um, my cat did not enjoy that at all. Um, it sounds like, it sounds like you got a furball there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dave, I think it's your fault. Um, in any event, he'll come back, though. You watch. Uh, in any event, uh, when Mal died on January 4th, 1976, really his, his effects uh, went into this kind of ether. Um, uh, there were other hands at play. Folks who maybe shouldn't have had them had them for a brief moment. Um, eventually, Mal's attorney, uh, Harold Lipton, and uh, Grosset and Dunlap as assumed control of them, still hoping to put out Mal's book, which he had just completed uh, the month before. And um, so began this kind of long period where they were essentially lost, but they were sitting in the basement of the New York Life Building, about 30 miles from here, um, where they they simply sat. Um, in, the, in the 80s, Putnam's acquired Grosset. And at that point, um, well, not immediately, they waited a few years, they, they went through their assets and they realized they could divest themselves of the New York Life Building facilities and move uptown further. And uh, at that point, or rather into Midtown, uh, at that point, they hired temps, uh, temporary workers to come in and clean up the place. And it was one of these temporary workers, a woman named Lena Kuti, a wonderful uh, Estonian immigrant. Um, found everything and said, wait a minute, this is important. Let's not just throw this away. When Lena wasn't getting any traction with the folks at Grosset, who began to see this as kind of a legal problem, because why do they have all this stuff, you know, 12, 12 years after this guy uh, has died? Um, they, they started to hold things up. And Lena is just wonderful. Um, I like to quote Hamilton at this point, because immigrants get the job done. You know, she didn't just wait. She had another job lined up for the next week, so she was about to leave Putnam's anyway. Uh, so she marched uptown to uh, the Dakota, left a note with the doorman, and uh, really in quick uh, order, Yoko took over, um, was able to uh, send the Apple lawyers, who were across the street, I believe, at the time from the New York Life Building. Uh, they came over and they said, we're here for our stuff. You know, this belongs to, uh, you know, a former employee. 
and he deserves, his family deserves to have it back. Let's get going. <laughs> and uh, it reminds us what good lawyering is all about. What an absolute uh, treasure trove. And to have all that contemporaneous material, because people's memories are now a bit sketchy. So to, to have contemporaneous material from that time is absolutely incredible. And there was a, a rumor that uh, the Dara's surfaced in Australia, I think, in 2005. But uh, <laughs> so they've yeah, almost been a, mythical uh, status now. Yeah, an itinerant dairy farmer, I think, uh, claimed that while he was on vacation in Australia, uh, he found this you know, briefcase. And Mal, Mal did carry briefcases around with all sorts of goodies in them as he collected his his own treasure trove, but also he had what he called his doctor's bag, you know, which and with everything under the sun for the boys. And uh, that was quickly proved to be a hoax, but it did light a little bit of a fire under the Evans estate, you know, that there was interest out there about this material. Mal wrote a lot of poetry. I understand there's hundreds, if not thousands, of verses of, of Mal's uh, poetry in, the, in these documents. Yet he's only credited uh, for, for one songwriting uh, um, composition with um, George Harrison, uh, You and Me, Babe, which I believe uh, Mal wrote most of and George helped him out to finish. What evidence are, is there in the manuscripts or the diaries of uh, Mao having contributed to some of the uh, lyrics of the, the, the Beatles' recorded work? Well, there, one good example, he was very proud of helping out with the last line of here, there, and everywhere, uh, watching her eyes and hoping I'm always there. He was very proud of that. So he, he recorded that contemporaneously in his uh, green 1966 notebook. Um, just he was thrilled that Paul had used the line. So there are moments like that. Uh, and you're right, Mal, Mal did pen thousands of, of poems, which for the most part were songs to be, right? Songs in, in stages of composition. There would be one other one um, on the, uh, well, there was a song with Splinter uh, that was produced that Mal co-wrote, um, Lonely Man, I think. But there was also a second song that Ringo tried out of Mal's during the Ringo sessions uh, that didn't make the album. It's a lovely tune that goes by several different titles, Thinking of You, Thinking of Me, uh, just a really a special Randy Newman-esque kind of song. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, You and Me, Babe, which Mal had started writing that back in uh, Rishikesh when the Beatles visited India. Wow. A very productive period for them all then. <laughs> it was. And, uh, you know, Mal, one of the things that the Beatles did for him was elevate his own interests, right? You know, he, when they became interested in Eastern philosophy, you know, he believed in them so much and was such an admirer of theirs that he too began to partake. What was Mal's contribution to Fix in a Hole? Because uh, that's when I think he went on record uh, publicly before these documents surfaced, saying that he, he had written a fair bit of the lyrics or helped Paul write that song. What, what did the diaries say about his contribution? The diaries are pretty silent about fixing a hole other than he helped. Um, he talks about sitting around a beautiful painted piano with Paul in Paul's music room and working on it. Um, it could just been as simple as uh, Mal fixing a hole where the rain gets in, possibly at Cavendish Avenue. I don't know on this one. Uh, Mal's pretty silent about that um, uh, as far as what the exact contribution is. Um, I guess he was very busy working at the time. So I guess when he was working, <laughs> his notes and diaries uh, sucked a little bit, I guess. That is always the case. You know, you really nailed the hit the nail on the head there. Mal was always working. The Beatles were always working. Um, one thing that you get a sense of when you study these diaries or his notebooks, especially, or the timeline of their recordings is just how incredibly busy they always were. These guys did not rest on their laurels. That's one of the reasons I think we can point to for why they grow so precipitously as musicians and, and evolve so quickly from, you know, Love Me Do, She Loves You, you know, Rubber Soul, Revolver. Uh, there's nothing like it. Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, The End. I mean, it's incredible, that arc. And uh, I think part of it was just they were constantly awash in creative energy. Mal is one of the few people credited with performing on a Beatles record. You Won't See Me is credited to Mal Evans' organ. Uh, <laughs> Mal organ. Loved, uh, yeah. A double yeah. entendre. They loved a schoolboy joke. Um, but... Um, 
what were his the scope of his uh, musical uh, capabilities? Because didn't he play trumpet on Hel Helter Skelter um, and harmonica on um, uh, what was it? Was it Fool on the Hill or Being for the Benefit of Mr. Being Kite? Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Mal would, uh, he, he would be there all night with them. He's one of the reasons they could stay all night in the studio. He could cook up a meal, go get, you know, new equipment from one of the, uh, you know, the instrument vendors. He could wake them up in the middle of the night. He had an extensive Rolodex, uh, but always being on hand and being one of the few people in their kind of inner circle, you know. Mal was happy to pick up a maraca or an alarm clock in the case of a day in the life and, you know, or an, anvil. <laughs> or an anvil, that's right. And, or a cowbell or whatever, and make some level of contribution. You know, he was, uh, he was there. He and Neil helped out on, on several songs. There's at least two dozen where Mal appears in some form. Uh, of course, very famously when they made uh, yellow submarine, he bounced around the studio leading a conga line with the bass drum um, you know, things like that. He was, uh, Mal was a good time. He was up for anything. And, um, you know, he was, he was a perfect kind of, uh, element to be part of their chemistry. And what, what was his musical training or how did he learn to play some of these instruments? Was it all on the hoof, um, over a period of time after he met the Beatles or was there any evidence before that he had any music? Well, I don't know that he'd ever picked up a trumpet before Helter Skelter, um, but that was around the same time that John Lennon picked up a saxophone. So who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> Mal did have uh, guitar lessons in the late 50s. He uh, was known to have at least a few times played a, a banjo at parties. So he was certainly not afraid to try his hand at anything, um, you know, and when it came to helping out to bang out that final chord on a day in the life, he was there for that, too. Um, I mean, he would be no more than a scratch player uh, as far as they were concerned. But again, just a handy guy to have around when you want one more sound on a song. Or when you want an anvil in the middle of the afternoon, you're recording. Um, well, is there that, and of course, the real, the real uh, accomplishment there is the fact that he knew how to get one. You know, in, in, uh, in really a split second, he found a uh, theatrical props uh, shop out in Twickenham. And he shows up with an anvil. Yeah, there weren't many blacksmiths left in central London in uh, 1969. That's so, right, so, yeah. <laughs> but um, I read that he actually hit the anvil because the, the hammer was, was too heavy for Ringo or Ringo didn't fancy playing it. Was there any sort of diary entry which uh, shed any light on, on he how he... doesn't shed any light other than he was really proud of playing the anvil that month because, you know, for the rest of his life, people would see him and, you know, mimic... Uh, playing an anvil so it was great fun for him I mean one thing we could point to is it wasn't a multi-tracked composition at all so Ringo was playing the drums mm -hmm. and Mal was playing on that live recording he was playing the uh, right there in the studio he was playing the anvil I think it was just as simple as Ringo only has so many hands and thanks to Peter Jackson's uh, Get Back, of course, he's now seen by a much wider audience other than us Beatles obsessives. So what did you make of uh, Mal's um, depiction in that movie? You know, it really showed, um, it just showed how versatile he was, you know, the expectations. You know, he's making tea in one minute, he's helping out with the lyrics of The Long and Winding Road in another you know, um, he's good natured support when he's needed. One of the scenes you don't see, um, it's alluded to um, where, where they point out that John is with a Canadian uh, team being interviewed. Mm. That was when John actually got physically ill uh, because mm. of his heroin usage. And Mal went and rescued John that day. Um, we have a great photo. We were able to round up from uh, one of the members of that crew where Mal is just head first coming into the meeting to rescue John. He was very cognizant that John was about to have a bad day and, and Mal was on top of it. I think it really illustrates as do those other scenes, just how useful it is to have somebody like that on your team, you know, a fixer in every sense of the word. And after George walks out, it's Mal who's actually on the phone to George and presumably played quite a big role in arranging that meeting that weekend between sure, all Sure, and them. even that night when uh, George worked with Brute Force on The King of Pho, Mal was at that session. <laughs> Classic track.
not. Yeah, but, it's a good one. <laughs> Again, that appealed to George's schoolboy sense of humor. I think that that. I uh, think it did. Talk. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the photos, and uh, there's so many of them in this treasure trove that uh, that you um, ended up with. Um, were there any photos taken of the meeting between the Beatles and Dylan at the Plaza Hotel in 1964? We've got nothing, and uh, there were no photos taken in the room with Elvis either. Um, you know, it's interesting. Today, there would be thousands, right? Mm. <laughs> you have photos of them coming in, photos of the event taken from different vantage points, different people, and of course, photos of, of the leaving. Uh, we really we really have nothing. So the first meeting with Dylan uh, was when he introduced them to, to cannabis, and I guess Mal also at the same time. Were, were there any diary entries made on that day, or, or were they, if they were, I should Only Mal were... recording the basics that we all know, you know, they're Paul asking him to take notes on uh, his thoughts as they came to him under the influence of weed. You know, there are seven levels. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, I looked through the materials. Gary Evans has looked through the materials. We've never found that note, so perhaps Paul has it. <laughs> maybe or maybe it didn't happen at all you know it's a difficult one to recollect isn't it uh, given the uh, the evening involved. and again uh, no uh, diary entries for the meeting with Elvis no but what Mal did for both of these was he would um, he would write them up in his notebook so um, he wrote up several dozen pages on the Elvis meeting and uh, and those would it, it, in the moment in 1965 um, and he would write about Elvis, I'm sorry, Dylan and the seven levels at the time, but he kept many different kinds of apparatus that he worked on. Like I said, he had notebooks, which were different from the, the diaries, mm. um, which would be different from um, other kinds of, or it would be different from his manuscript. So Mal was working uh, probably because he was so damn busy. He was working in all of these different kinds of um, uh, documents um, sometimes simultaneously. And so part of what I had to do to write this book was to learn when he was making those shifts, you know, so I could follow along and capture his story more in the moment uh, than, than otherwise I would have been able. That meeting with Elvis uh, in Beverly Hills, I think all the Beatles had very different accounts during the anthology um, and obviously recollections vary over time. But uh, what were Mal's own recollections of that meeting? And, and did they play I Feel Fine? Did they jam together? They did play, uh, for sure. And uh, Mal, um, you know, Mal being a huge fan of Elvis, I mean, that was his favorite act, period. Uh, the Beatles mm -hmm. were a very close second, but he adored Elvis. Elvis is why, in a lot of ways, he went down the cavern steps in the first place, because he heard, he heard were good rock and roll that reminded him of Elvis, is what he said. Uh, about that moment in 1961 when he first descended the cavern steps. But, um, you know, Mal, Mal took very careful notes. And, and for him, the real tragedy of the evening is that for once he didn't have guitar picks. And so he, he fashioned plectrums out of uh, plastic cutlery in the kitchen and was really embarrassed uh, by the fact that he, he didn't deliver on that one occasion. Well, that's where his GPO training came in handy, I guess. I don't know if that was the GPO or just being able to break cutlery and and create <laughs> makeshift picks. But uh, yeah, Elvis played bass, I believe, uh, during the jam session. They did a lot that night. You know, Mal was just blown away by all of the uh, uh, what what felt to him like luxury of Elvis's house there in Bel Air. He went to the uh, you know he he saw the pool table, which blew his mind. The big TV. You know, all of these things that to him seem so newfangled and so American uh, really excited him. Things in post-war Britain were pretty grim, even in, even in the mid-60s. So I can understand how people look to, to, to the U.S. because it was so far ahead in, in many ways and had a, a level of wealth that uh, we didn't have over here. So his affinity with uh, the with all things Americanas is quite understandable. Same Same with all the Beatles, clearly. Oh, absolutely. Although, I mean, you know, they were well aware that rationing didn't end until 53, almost the mid 50s. Um, you know, the, the recovery effort rebuilding the country was much different than it was in the U.S. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, Mal was enamored with American culture, particularly the Old West, like a lot of Brits. 
you know, he was interested in that lawless period or that supposedly lawless period with people walking around with guns and hoping that they can stave off civilization a little longer. I'm, I'm fascinated with the, the picture that was chosen for the, the cover of Living the Beatles Legend. Um, I understand Mal came into the group initially via George through the cavern. And of course, post Beatles, he was most friendly with, but with George, uh, Ringo and John. Uh, less so with Paul, which I guess was the same with all three of them due to the, the split at the time. But the, the photograph on, on the front cover of, of Mal with, with Paul alone, what was the, the reason behind choosing that particular photo? <laughs> Well, um, you know, the fascinating thing about publishing is that, of course, the press has the final say on titles, on covers, as they should. I mean, they don't need, need me picking something that, you know, will sell the book poorly uh, or what have you. But they were enamored with that photo. Um, the designer was. And, you know, I, I simply trusted their logic. I've heard a lot from uh, readers that, that it, it bothers them somewhat you know, that it's just Paul. I did recommend a few photos where you had more Beatles or all the Beatles. Um, I don't think they were just going to have Mal on the cover, uh, given the importance of that association, you know, with the greatest musical fusion of all time. Um, so that wasn't going to happen. Uh, I, I began to like the, the cover a little bit when uh, one of my colleagues here in the English department saw it when we were first looking at it. And she said, oh, I love that. Paul's performing because he's looking at the camera, almost waving, you know, and, right. and uh, I do kind of like that too. It, it shows interesting sides of their personality, Mal sort of looking off and Paul engaging directly with the camera. And of course they went away on holiday together as well. I think it was 66 when Paul asked uh, Mal to meet him at uh, Bordeaux and ended up driving on to Madrid and then ended up catching a flight over to uh, the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro in Nairobi. In, in Kenya. So um, what, what, what did Mal say about that particular trip? Were there any revelations that came through that trip? You know, there so, were lots of yeah. stories, but they're not what I think uh, us Beatles people might expect. They're really humanizing stories, right? You know, he, he just loved the Beatles as people. He, he really adored Paul. And, uh, you know, they're just lots of moments of two guys hanging out, having a good time you know, sometimes kicking around ideas, but for the most part, you know, seeing places <clears throat> like, like you just described, like Nairobi for the first time. I mean, this was a revelation for them. You know, they were two guys who might otherwise have never left Liverpool, you know, and suddenly they kind of have the keys to the world. So there was a lot of really fun travel uh, that they would share. And it's really more heartwarming than it is in terms of big revelations about the Beatles story. And of course, he didn't put Paul off uh, going back to Africa to record Band on the Run. Very different circumstances in Lagos. Yeah, he should have rethought that probably. Uh, he, he needed better travel advice um, about the safety after that civil war. Well, there was only cholera and uh, diphtheria and yellow fever. Only that to contain with plus a civil war, as you mentioned. So That's what right. could go wrong? <laughs> it's, you just have to maneuver carefully and you're fine. And sort of moving forward to a year later to 67, uh, when they go off to buy Greek islands, how, how serious a proposition was that? You know, Mal was just, uh, um, Mal was, uh, for that, he was just sort of a being there, being Mal, doing his level best, you know, to deal with those situations. It was, uh, that was really Magic Alex who was driving some of that. And uh, Mal was an observer, but but a fun one for sure. But uh, how far down the road did they get apart from sort of going over there? Oh, they bought the there? island. I mean, they bought it and I think they sold it as a at a slight profit. Right. But it was just basically a tax uh, dodge more than anything else. No, I think they really built, believe the kind of utopian hippie dream of the mid 60s of let's buy an island. We'll all live on it together. You know, we'll have separate houses and a tunnel underneath. And you know, they, I think they really bought into it until the moment when they didn't, you know, which yeah. was uh, sort of toward the end. And of course, by then it was wrapped up in, in Brian's untimely death. But I, I do think they legitimately believed in it for a time. You mentioned Brian there. I think Brian uh, responded quite badly to the end of the touring years um, and having less of a role in the Beatles' lives. 
But uh, that didn't seem to be the case for Mal. If anything, Mal was in greater demand by the Beatles after they stopped touring. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And I, I do think that both Mal and Neil uh, would have felt like Brian, at least initially, like, what will our role be now that we're not on the road, you know, this many times a year? And they quickly discovered that, if anything, you know, their time was even more accounted for. You know, they were in constant demand. Now everybody was more stationary in London. Uh, Mal moves his family to London in 1967 to have close proximity uh, sort of between all of the different Beatles locations. He was mostly equidistant from them. Um, and they quickly found that, uh, you know, they again, they were in more demand because the Beatles now had unfettered access to the studio, which is where they recognized that their greatest um, endeavors were taking place. It certainly wasn't on the road where nobody could hear them and they were playing 25 minute, sometimes out of tune sets. But he pops up everywhere during this period, doesn't he, after they stopped touring? I mean, in, in 68, he's uh, accompanying George over to uh, Big Pink, um, but and, and obviously that whole session with Dylan. So he's there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the Beatles, uh, particularly when they would take these solo trips in 67, 68, 69, liked to be accompanied. Mal was often the guy. Uh, Lily, Mal's uh, widow, uh, who recently died herself, said that, you know, they would get jealous of who got Mal. Uh, because he was fun to travel with. You know, he was very good at looking after things. Again, he's a fixer. So if there's trouble in some new city or or new country, Mal knows how to handle it. He knows how to get out of those close, uh, close scrapes. And uh, yet he failed to get into the army on, on medical grounds. I think it was due to uh, a broken toenail, I think, of all a things. A broken toenail, and, uh, possibly the yeah. whooping cough. Uh, but yeah, Mal, that was a great source of distress for him. Uh, back, that would have been 1953 when he wasn't selected. He was really crushed. And actually, when the Beatles were about to hire him full time, he had started working as a volunteer for the territorials, um, although that quickly went by the wayside when uh, when Mal was hired full time by the Beatles. Yeah, and that was quite a big decision for him also, I guess, to uh, to throw in a, a great job with pension, steady job with a, a young family coming and uh, to uh, risk it all on, on joining the uh, the Beatles circus. You know, I think I would have recommended to him that he not do it, um, mm -hmm. frankly. You know, in, those, in that moment, when you're talking about a pop group uh, and pop groups had almost no shelf life in 1963, as good as this one was, uh, with two chart-topping songs by that point, um, to give up a pension, uh, the ability to have a, a steady income to pay for his house and his car, you know, he was the first in his family to be educated and to have, you know, to have a car and a house. I mean, the, the Evans family didn't have a car. Uh, they had a, a motorcycle with a sidecar, you know, so this was a big deal. And there was a lot of stress in the family about Mal's decision to do this. Uh, and again, I, you know, even knowing what we know now, well, we didn't know what we know now. In the moment, I think I would have advised him the same way. Don't do it. What are you, what are you talking about? You know, what are you going to do a year and a half from now when these guys are on the cabaret circuit? He seemed very much uh, starstruck and every opportunity to appear in front of the camera. I think he was in every Beatles live action movie uh, in some way or some role. I remember the cross-channel swimmer um, in, in Help when he just bursts up amongst the uh, ice flow, uh, wearing a very, he <laughs> must be frozen to death when he did that. But any, he was up any, for anything. He's... Yeah, he was up for anything, but he did like, as Tony Bramwell told me, Bramwell said, you know, he loves to photobomb. Mal would, Mal loved to be in the photos. He would get a little miffed when they would meet stars, um, especially movie stars, and he wasn't allowed to be in the photos or to pose with them. Right, right. One thing I'm fascinated by, and we're going to be doing a video on this shortly, is the Mad Day Out. And of course, not only was Mal there on the, the Mad Day Out, but also Gary was there as well and appears in some of the photographs um, in, um, in St. Pancras. Um, how, how did that whole day unfold? Because it's just, I think it's, there's uh, Mal driving, Paul, I think Paul's driving himself and Mal's got the other three Beatles with him. And then there's three photographers, I think, in tow. And um, it all seems a little bit haphazard <laughs> where they're going. Yes. I mean, uh, Gary um, was there too, Gary Evans. Um, mm. You know, it was kind of a lark, really. Uh, they were making up some of it as they went along. 
Um, we tried to recreate it last summer. And of course, with traffic and London being what it is, you can't nearly uh, come close to the way they were able to move through the city uh, back in their day. It's, uh, as you know, completely different. Um, but uh, yeah, Mal was Mal was commandeering one vehicle. He took a lot of photos himself. You can always tell because they're sort of side angles of the famous <laughs> shots that we know. Sometimes they're right. a bit blurry. Sometimes they're spot on. Gary took a number of photos that day with his own camera too. Um, so they had a lot of fun. It was kind of a father-son memory in a lot of ways for those two. Was that one of the few occasions where Gary joined his dad with the um, Beatles? Well, they weren't that few. I mean, Gary would go over to all of their houses. Um, he had different things he liked. He loved Ringo's pets and hanging out at Ringo's estate. He liked to be able to paint the walls of Ken Fawn and Esher at George's place. He loved John's swimming pool. Um, he really admired Paul because Paul was one of Mal, his dad's best mates. So there's a great scene in the book where they're preparing to go over to Cavendish Avenue and Gary is spending an inordinate amount of time on his hair you know, to make sure he looks good. And uh, Mal was at uh, Paul and Linda's uh, wedding in 69. How, how did the Beatles, the other Beatles take that? The fact that they weren't invited and yet Mal's there. Was that a source of conflict between them? Or I don't think it was at or? all. You know, that all of these things were so hasty. The same could be said for John and Yoko's wedding. You know, it wasn't as though people were being intentionally left out. It's, you know, they were leading these crazy busy lives. Um, you know, so, you know, it was good to have Mal along for, for that occasion. They trusted him implicitly, so much so that when he mentioned that he was going to be writing a diary, uh, the, mo the advice was just go ahead, tell the truth. But how much pressure do you think, if any, that it, they, they put him under to not, to not go too far and to reveal too many things that they would prefer not to be published? I think they put zero pressure on him, actually, when he was writing his memoirs in 75. They, you know, they all four gave their endorsement um, uh, for the project. Uh, I, I, I saw no evidence of them trying to limit him or censor him in any way. Just Ringo's great line about tell the truth. If you're going to do something like this, tell the truth. And Mal really tells the truth about himself. You know, he exposes him way in himself in ways that most by autobiographers never think to do. Um, and he really mapped the way for us to be able to think about how to write this biography, right? Um, but no, I, I didn't see them put any kind of restrictions on them, on him. Do you think he self-edited that he was well aware that, you know, where the line was and he sort of drew back from anything that he thought might embarrass him so much with his love for uh, for all of them? That is possible. You know, we can we can glean a certain sense of Mal understanding that he was writing for posterity that, mm. you know, when you keep a diary or you keep notebooks or you write a memoir, you are writing a document that, that may inevitably be, that will likely inevitably be public um, particularly when it's associated with the story of this nature. So um, I do think he recognized that there was some kind of line, but he certainly didn't mind telling us about how many times he had crossed that line uh mm. his documentation it could have been a way of for him to confess you know to his behaviors over all those years or it could be a way to maybe mask some of the beatles behavior and uh you know taking a bullet for them in a way and, and, sorry that's terrible i don't want to say no no i don't know that i don't think yeah. that's it i think he really i think he did feel the need to expiate himself you know he was he knew he'd been as much as he loved being father and husband he knew he was a disappointment you know, I mean, he, there had to be no doubt in his mind that every time he had a question between Beatles and family, Beatles won. I mean, I I think he felt a significant amount of guilt about that. And actually, okay. that leads to his demise, right? I mean, Lily, when, when she says, I'm going to seek out an attorney, which she never actually visits, because by the time she would have, Mal's dead. Um, that's what sets those final events into motion. I mean, he... He really, um, I think, was deathly guilty about the way he behaved and uh, felt like that was his comeuppance. Such a sad end, it really is. Um, and he left Apple, was it in 73, when he actually wrote a, a letter to all the Beatles saying he was going? Is that correct? 
Um, I don't know that he did that. Um, he wrote a will the night before on January 3rd, 1976, before, you know, they right. sent police and everything went haywire. Uh, but, you know, before that, uh, I don't know that he wrote them all a collective letter. Okay. If he did, tell me about it, because I, I want to make sure I've covered I, it. Maybe it's me. I, I, I sort of dimly remember that he got in touch with them. And I think... Um... I think George said something like, so what, when, when ah, I was told. Him no, was no, no, no. So, yeah, what you're referring yeah. to is quite interesting. Um, is uh, Mal in 74 decided um, he wanted to try to really strike out on his own and not rest on his laurels of being their road manager and to try to, you know, be a, a producer more often, certainly to publish more of his songs and perhaps get them recorded by, you know, acts uh, who were working at the time and um, he made a, a conscious decision to go to the estate that John and May Peng were renting in Santa Monica mm -hmm. this would have been uh, I guess the first weekend in April first full weekend in April 1974 and as it happened Paul showed up it was the second time he'd come to visit John at the estate and uh, for that reason, um, Mal took the opportunity to tell Paul, too. So he said, you know, I'm going to go out on my own and really try to, to make this happen. And Paul and John said wonderful things, you know, good for you. You deserve it. You got it. You got this. Um, really behaving in the way friends should. Hmm. It was George who I think didn't believe it for a second. I think George knew that Mal couldn't couldn't make that transition away from them and did right. say so what. And of course, George was completely right. You know, Mal doesn't make that full shift away from them at all he's working on good night vienna within a matter of weeks you know um I, I think not only was he typecast to the world that he worked for them but probably typecast in his own mind that this is uh what he should be doing and he certainly was devoted to them so that could be factored in as well um it was ringo who was even more touching ringo said wonderful platitudes about good luck mal but cried to Harry Nielsen that night that now that Mal's left, the Beatles are really over. Um, of course, Mal didn't really leave. And as we've discovered in these last few weeks with the Beatles having a number one song in the UK, the Beatles are never over. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. And there's just so much material that uh, now we have Mal, <laughs> machine assisted learning Mal. Uh, <laughs> now we have that where there's a whole, you know, treasure trove of stuff that it has to be released at some stage i believe i i heard a rumor that apple have a five-year plan a release plan so nobody really knows what it is a few people do in the inner circle obviously but it'd be nice to think that uh, a lot of the the get back material i mean peter jackson has remastered all of the uh, all the footage but we're only seeing less than eight, nine hours of that there's just so much to come i, I want to see the um the um footage from uh, the hey jude uh, I think it was a, a BBC camera crew recorded about 12 hours of that. And there's only about 15 minutes on, on YouTube. But uh, that is crying out to be shown, obviously, um, live at the Star Club. There's just so much that uh, now we have the technology that, that can follow. So, no, I, I hope rather than the end, it's a beginning. Oh, it always is. The Beatles will have many new beginnings uh, waiting for them. And, of course, post-split Mal was... You know, and he had his fingerprints over a lot of the uh, the post Beatles projects. He um, he was working with um, George on All Things Must Pass. He was on Instant Karma, obviously the Ringo album where we almost saw a reunion of all four of them. Um, so he's very much in demand, very much. Imagine the Plastic Ono Band record, all of those, yeah. Blue and he took the real world, <laughs> and he took the Ivers under his wing, um, and that that strikes me as one of his biggest regrets because he would have done. You know, as much as he would have done for the Beatles, he would have done for the Ivy. And he, he had the, the the privilege to uh, to produce, um, um, you know, one, you know, incredible track for them from No Dice. Yeah, you know, um, the, one of the most heartbreaking stories in in Mal's biographical life is absolutely the bad finger. Um, he adored them. He really felt like he was the one guy who could produce them and, and help them grow and nurture them. And of course, history has proven him to be correct. When when Alan Klein forbade Mal from working with uh, with Badfinger, they then went into the hands of you know several 
nefarious people, the paranoid Billy Collins, and then, you know, the truly nefarious Stan Polly, um, who was named in at least one of their suicide mm -hmm. notes, you know, um, it uh, what a what a heartbreaker, you know, one of the most promising act in the Apple stable and uh, for it to all go that way. Just a just a heartbreaker. A uh, real tragedy. So um, and uh, the end of Mal and also of uh, Pete and Tom as well from Badfinger. It's, you know, it's just, you know, so sad, you know, and so much loss and, uh, and sickening in a certain level. I mean, you know, again, yeah. if, you, if you didn't like Alan Klein before, which I think most people understand his negative role in, in this story, it's not going to get better. No, and uh, there's a lot of that within the Beatles story, isn't there? There's an overdose with Brian, obviously the sad uh, assassination of, of John in 1980. It's just, you know, it's uh, almost, uh, it's not a never-ending ro roller coaster of joy and love by any means. Uh, it's no. life in, in all its colours. So, Kent, you're working on, I believe, the next project is going to be a publication of Mal's diaries with annotations and photographs. And uh, when can we expect to see that in the shops? Hopefully in time well, for next Christmas. <laughs> Hopefully uh, this time next year. Um, it will have uh, many, many more photos. I'm happy to point out that um, that uh, we have a, a even greater photo allowance full color uh, replication, um, all the diaries, of course, all the manuscripts. Um, it really be quite something, I believe. And, and what I love the most about it is it will be everybody else's opportunity to go down the Mal rabbit hole and uh, find their own stories, you know, inside those documents. He names hundreds, if not a thousand names of folks who are connected to the Beatles story. It really should be a whole new avenue for people to uh, to enjoy and and think about just that incredible musical fusion and what's it's left for all of us. Will there be a volume three after volume two? <laughs> I think I'm good for two. I think three may be pushing it. Um, you know, I, I don't know what we'd add for a three anyway, uh, frankly, um, you know, but uh, two, two will certainly uh, give folks a sense of what this was all about. All of these materials that Mal so assiduously collected and preserved for so long. Well, there's one one story that I'd really love to see, and that's the story of Neil Aspinall. I don't think that's been properly told uh, yet, so it'd be fantastic to see something about Neil in the future. You know, that was uh, that was a big one for me. Um, I did make sure that as I interviewed folks, I got a sense of how Neil and Mal interacted. You know, sometimes they would work people; they'd have like a good cop, bad cop situation. Um, so I was, I've been very careful to try to learn as much as I can about Neil and how he operated, um, sometimes, well, often, uh, simultaneously with Mal and, and working on purpose to create certain outcomes. Um, there is a lot more we could certainly know about Neil. That's for sure. Ken, thank you so much for being with us today and for also giving us a living the Beatles legend, the untold story of Mal Evans. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you.